Hello, I'm Liam and welcome to this video on the best vegetables to grow to save money. In this video, I'll share my top 10 money-saving vegetables based on my experience of how easy and productive the vegetables are to grow and also their comparative cost in the shops. I'll talk about harvesting times, the length of the growing season and tips on harvesting and cooking the crops. And I'll cover the reasons why I've left other vegetables off the list. But before getting going, just to say that I regularly publish videos on growing fruits, vegetables and herbs. And if you'd like to see these videos, please subscribe to my YouTube channel in the usual way. Also, you may like to see the growing guides on my website, allotmentbook.co.uk. But does growing your own vegetables really save money? By way of introduction, I think it is worth saying that if someone is making a decision between investing time in working a garden or allotment versus getting a job and buying fruits and vegetables with the money they earn, I think choosing a job is much the better option. Growing vegetables is time consuming and takes many weeks and often several months to get a harvest. And if a gardener is successful, the harvest comes in a short period of time, sometimes more than the gardener can eat and therefore the harvest will need to be stored. And for some crops, that is not easy to do or is time consuming. There is a risk of failure for all the work invested, especially in wet or very hot summers, or if wildlife eats the crops or the plants suffer from disease. And then there is the startup cost of buying garden tools, buying the seeds and any protective nets for the plants. But having said all that, I think it is still possible to save money by growing vegetables, provided that the effort is in addition to other forms of income, rather than attempting to replace it. And that is the key, I think, to treat growing vegetables as a rewarding hobby that provides a wonderful opportunity to be outdoors and interact with nature and have the satisfaction of growing things successfully. And as well as saving money, growing your own allows the opportunity to grow vegetable varieties that are not available in the shops and they're grown organically, without pesticides or artificial fertilizers. So how have I chosen my top 10 money-saving vegetables to grow? As I mentioned earlier, the vegetables I've selected are ones that I think are reliable or easy to grow and produce a good sized harvest. Whilst cauliflowers are absolutely delicious, they are difficult to grow and are a big plant that requires a large space that could be used for growing other crops. And they don't keep well. But ease of growing and harvest size are not the only considerations. Perhaps the most important point of all is that it's only worth growing a vegetable if a gardener enjoys eating it. And I've learnt this by growing swedes and turnips. I enjoy one or two as extra ingredients and meals, but not a whole row of 50 of them. I simply won't eat them. Therefore, my list is biased to vegetables that I commonly want to cook with. Not on my list are vegetables that are prone to diseases or pests. Whilst homegrown carrots are delicious, unfortunately, on my plot, they are attacked by carrot fly to the extent that I've stopped growing them. Broad beans are highly susceptible to aphid attack in early summer. Whilst this can be controlled to some extent by washing them off, the job is no fun and the harvest size is reduced. And cabbage, unfortunately, is all too often eaten by caterpillars or infested with whitefly. Whilst the net can solve this, insect netting is relatively expensive and therefore cabbage has not made my list. Also, I think it's worth considering the comparative cost of purchasing the vegetable in a shop. Lettuce are relatively cheap to grow, but are often very cheap to buy. The same goes for other crops like radish, onions and even garlic. Therefore, they are not in my top 10. But not all vegetables are cheap in the shops and some are surprisingly expensive whilst being quite easy to grow. I talked earlier that a homegrown harvest of vegetables tends to come all at once. That is not actually true for some crops as some have a long harvest season and others can be stored well. So I have favoured on my list crops that either provide a long harvest or that store well. A quick word on tomatoes and other heat loving crops like aubergine, chilies and sweet peppers. My experience is that these perform best inside my polytunnel where the harvest is reliably big and spread over many weeks. 
Outside, the harvests are much smaller. For this reason only, I'm leaving heat-loving vegetables off my list due to the cost of purchasing a polytunnel, greenhouse, or even constructing a conservatory or glass lean-to. So what's left? Well, there are some, and it's time to reveal the list. So let's get going. My top 10 list of money-saving vegetables to grow. I almost did not put potatoes on the list, as they are relatively inexpensive to buy in the shops. However, not all potatoes are alike. Growing your own potatoes opens up a whole range of different varieties that can't be bought in shops or are the type of potatoes sold at premium prices. Potatoes provide exercise for a gardener when growing as they require a good amount of soil over the tubers to create the growing space for the potatoes. But this effort is rewarded. A single seed potato can provide a 2.5 kg bag sized harvest and whilst potatoes are not high in nutrients, they are packed full of energy which means that they can form the basis of a meal, ideally when combined with more nutrient-rich vegetables. And potatoes store well, in the right conditions from late summer to the beginning of spring. And that's why, combined with the range of varieties available, potatoes are on the list. Beetroot is packed full of nutrients and in my view, delicious to eat. I think it makes an excellent ingredient in soups, but best of all, it is delicious roasted, which really brings out the sweetness of the crop. Beetroot seed is relatively cheap to buy, and a row of beetroot does not take up much growing space. My experience with growing beetroot is that the seedlings are typically not eaten by slugs and snails, that seem to prefer other things. And once the beetroot is ready, it can be left on the plot and harvested when required, although it's best not to allow the bulbs to get too large. For interest, it's possible to grow different colours of beetroot too. Kale is one of the most nutritious vegetables it is possible to grow. I think one of the reasons people don't eat kale more often is because of its taste, but I think that is more down to how it is cooked. My two tips for cooking kale is to cut out the central stem, these go back on the compost heap, and the second is to cook the remaining leaves slowly in a saucepan with an inch or so of boiling water in the bottom and covered with a lid. This effectively steams the leaves and after 30 minutes the leaves are soft and surprisingly sweet. I think the standout feature of kale is its hardiness, with mature plants able to withstand the winter weather and provide a harvest from the autumn through to the spring. There's no need to harvest the whole plant. By growing two or three plants, a few leaves can be harvested from each plant to provide a meal, allowing the plants to grow more leaves. Young kale plants may need protecting with a net to keep the birds off them, and whitefly can be a problem too. That's why I prefer to grow flat leaf kale, as the whitefly is much easier to wash off flat kale leaves than other varieties with curly ones. I wanted to have one member of the onion family in my top 10, but I chose not to include onions, shallots or garlic, as they are relatively cheap to buy in the shops. Leeks make an excellent substitute for onion in many dishes to provide extra flavour, and I think they are especially good in soup. They are relatively easy to grow with very few pests. Another reason they are on my list is the length of the harvest season. Mature leeks are really hardy, and can be left standing out on the allotment plot even after the cold weather arrives in winter and dug up as required. Alternatively, if planted later in summer, the crop matures for a spring harvest. I have two members of the bean family on my list and the first are dwarf French beans. These grow really quickly and provide their nutritious harvest in midsummer and despite their size, provide a bounty of beans. And best of all, the more the beans are picked, the more beans are produced. Overall, dwarf French beans are highly productive plants, but when small, they may need some protection from both birds and slugs. And before moving on, my cooking tip to prevent squeaky beans when eating is to cook them longer. I cook mine in a frying pan with a little oil, covered with a lid, 
over a low to medium heat for about 30 minutes. The beans are deliciously sweet and squeak free when cooked this way. There is a lot to be said for growing vertically as it is a highly productive use of space. Runner beans are one of the best plants for this with the limits on their height being how high a gardener can reach. I make my runner bean frame about two meters high. Runner beans provide the harvest towards the end of the growing season and that's why I think a combination of the earlier harvesting French beans followed by runner beans is a great combination. I prefer to harvest the pods before they get too long and stringy. The pods freeze well and then they can be enjoyed throughout the winter adding their flavour and nutrients to many types of meals. I really enjoy eating baby spinach in salad and traditional spinach cooked on the hob but the truth is normal spinach is quite difficult to grow as it bolts or runs to flower very easily in periods of hot weather and sudden heat waves are increasingly common. This is where New Zealand spinach excels. Once the plants are established, they grow rapidly and are much more tolerant of difficult growing conditions without running to seed. They produce lots of leaves that can be cooked just like normal spinach, although I would not add them to salads. The only tricky part of growing New Zealand spinach is getting the seed to germinate in the spring. However, after one growing season, I found that New Zealand spinach self-seeds round my allotment plot, making it easy to transplant these seedlings to the beds where I want to grow them. Chard is another member of the spinach family, and I think it is even easier to grow than New Zealand spinach. My favourite way of eating chard is in soup, with the leaves and the stalks giving a soup a really rich, almost gravy-like flavour. The leaves are highly nutritious, being particularly high in vitamin A. Chard seed reliably germinates, but it takes a number of weeks until the plants are ready to be harvested. It's best to grow a number of plants and harvest a few leaves from each. And that way, a row of chard plants can provide leaves throughout the summer and well into autumn. Both the leaves and stems are eaten. The leaves can be cooked, wilted like spinach, and if cooked this way, it's best to choose younger leaves, which will be less chewy. The stems are delicious on their own and can be steamed or boiled. But as I said, my favourite way of eating chard is in soup, where I think it really stands out. Courgettes, or zucchini, are relatively easy to grow. And in fact, when the plants get going in late June, they can be absolutely prolific. Three or four plants are more than enough to provide a weekly harvest through to September. My tip for growing courgettes is not to plant out the young plants too early in the season or when they are small. Courgettes are frost sensitive, so a late frost will kill the plants. Also, slugs and snails enjoy eating their way through the stems of young plants. The trick is to allow the plants to grow larger before planting out. When bigger, the stems are much tougher and difficult to chew. And once the warm weather properly arrives, the plants grow very quickly to a large size, over a metre wide and almost as tall. For this reason, I would not suggest growing courgettes in containers. Given how easy they are to grow, I've never really understood why they are relatively expensive to buy in shops. And that's the main reason why courgettes are so high on my list. One recipe I'd recommend for courgettes is a Spanish courgette stew that they call pisto, often served with eggs. It's a delicious meal and a great way of eating up a bumper courgette harvest. Courgettes would be number one, but for one reason. They are so prolific that at their peak, their fruit can grow so quickly that it becomes too much to eat them all, combined with the fact that courgettes do not store well. And that is the reason why I've chosen the relative of courgette, winter squash, as my number one money-saving vegetable. Unlike courgettes would need to be picked small, winter squash can be left to grow large. Their flavour is not affected by their size. In fact, the large seeds inside winter squash can be enjoyed roasted. Whilst butternut squash is commonly found in shops, there are many other shapes and sizes of winter squash to grow and enjoy. The plants need to be started the same way as courgettes, meaning avoiding frosts 
are not planted out when small. The difference is that winter squash grow more slowly, with the fruit most likely not ready to be harvested before August. The tough outer skin of winter squash is not eaten, but what it does is to provide a protective casing that means the squash stores really well, right through to early spring, provided they are kept in a cool and dry place. And perhaps best of all, squash is delicious. I enjoy eating squash in two main ways. It makes a great ingredient for soups, helping to thicken it and provide sweetness. It can also be made into mash, just like potato. But best of all, I think squash is great roasted, either as a more nutritious replacement for potatoes or as an additional side dish. When cooked in olive oil and with the addition of a little salt, roasted winter squash is one of my favourite things to eat in the whole year. And that's it. I hope you liked this video on what I think are the best vegetables to grow to save money. If you did, please let me know by hitting the like button or leaving a comment. You may like to see my vegetable growing guides, which are available on my website, allotmentbook.co.uk. And lastly, just to mention that this video has not covered growing fruit. I found that growing fruit like gooseberries, taybreeze and boysenberries, as well as apples on my apple tree, is easy to do and really saves money too. I regularly create videos on growing fruit, vegetables and herbs. And if you would like to see these videos, please subscribe to my YouTube channel in the usual way.